Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Out of Spec podcast. You join me today with Mark. How do you say your last name? Wiltin. Wiltin. Yeah, I know. It's a bit hard for non-German speakers. <laughs> yes, so thank you for that. Um, we're here at Charin, the Testable, and you are basically the genius behind 15118. You wrote the handbook on it, really. And so you have an incredible background. And today you're here with Switch, right? And that's what we're going to be talking about, your work um, on the back end, really, to help make charging the best experience that it can be for consumers and how you integrate that with the hardware providers and the charge point operators as well. So thank you for coming on to the podcast today and being in person. I love when we can do these in person. That's the best part. So yeah, do you mind uh, just introducing yourself a bit to our audience and telling us what your goal here is today at the Testable? Okay. Well, Francis, thanks for, thanks for having me here. Um, so we're here at the Char-In uh, Testival North America. These testing events are all about interoperability testing um, because uh, you know cars and chargers, they need to talk to each other in the same language uh, based on international agreed upon communication standards. And uh, it's not always very straightforward. So what we're doing here is making sure that the implementations on the charger and the implementation of the standard on, the, on an electric vehicle uh, works fine, there no issues. And um, we're here in Cleveland, Ohio right now, and uh, we are testing Joseph, which is our operating system for EV chargers, for AC and DC chargers. Um, and the idea here is that uh, charger manufacturers, um, they shouldn't worry about implementing the standards, redefining, you know, reinventing the wheel, and focusing more on their USBs. And this is not implementing standards, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we help them to go to market faster with our embedded operating system, which is like a firmware on EV chargers. Very cool. I mean, it seems like this is really important, especially if someone's going to come to market and match what's already out there, right? Or improve on what they already have for their offering. And of course, as you can see behind us, um, and I'll make sure to get like a copy of this and zoom in, but you can really see the the details of Joseph that we'll dive into. Right now we're in the actual space where the testing is happening, which is why I'm not panning anywhere else because it is very important to just get approval for photos and videos because there's a lot of really amazing testing going on that is a little bit hush-hush here and there, you know, but really trying to work on that interoperability. That's a big goal here, right? So why do you think it's important that you and your company are here today at this event specifically with your offer? Because, uh, well, Joseph, what we plan to do with Joseph is to make it a like a default software on, on EV chargers. At least we try to enable the industry um, to adopt the latest communication standards, not just for the sake of, because it's a nice new technology, but it's kind of uh, uplifting the user experience. For example, plug and charge. So you don't need RFID cards or apps or fiddle around with your you know credit card. Um, this is enabled through ISO 15118. Then uh, OCPP, which is the uh, Open Charge Point Protocol, comes in different flavors. Um, and the latest OCPP version allows for a lot more advanced diagnostics. Think about it as an MRI scanner that you put over the charger, right? A lot more diagnostics data, which is important for charge point operators. It reduces uh, maintenance costs and increases uptime. And that's what Switch is all about. And we do it through a vertically integrated solution, the embedded firmware on the charger and the cloud-based switch platform, as we call it, which is our own backend, a charging station management system. Because the issue is we see a lot of, um, or the industry is very fragmented. You have the car that needs to talk to the charger, the charger talks to the backend, the backend talks to the MSP provider, PKI ecosystem, it's like a mess, right? And if you want to really make, um, like improve the system significantly, you need to think about a holistic solution, vertically integrated, without a lock-in effect, based on open standards, and that's what we are trying to do here at Switch. Very cool, yeah, I mean, if you just think about when you're plugging in your EV, there's a lot of points at which failure can happen, and then if you go macro scale with all the different mm. pieces that you're talking about that are making charging possible, there's even more problem, or potential cases of failure along exactly. the way. So, um, you know, you have found, you've identified a, maybe a gap where you can fill in and add some value to these charge point operators to make it so that what they're offering is just far more enhanced, that their customers are having a better experience. And so how, how important do you think that is to weave in throughout what you're doing? I mean, here you're testing with not only the hardware that you're charging with, but also EVs, right? So can you tell us a little bit about like how you're fitting in with not only is it just charge point operators that you're working with, or do you ever collaborate with OEMs on what they're doing and how they could improve? 
Yeah, so um, it's important to understand that Joseph, which you see here in the background, is targeted at charging station manufacturers. The switch platform is targeted at charge point operators. So it's two different clientele. Yes. Although in the end, um, a charging manufacturer may also be interested in using the switch platform for the purpose of getting better diagnostics data of all the chargers across the entire world, wherever they may be deployed. So we're thinking about offering the switch platform not only for CPOs, but also for charger manufacturers. Mm -hmm. But the operating system is, as the name says, an embedded firmware operating system. Very yeah. cool. So you have a charger back here. Can we look at that? And you can, sure. can you tell me a little bit about like what you're able to do at this event with this charger and find out. Have you found out anything interesting <laughs> with your testing? So this here is a Zaptec AC wallbox charger. Zaptec is from Norway, and they are one of our customers of Joseph. So this means that this Zaptec uh, Pro charger is now enabled for ISO 15118-2, uh, which is the um, standard that is now coming to market, um, and also OCPP 2.0.1. Although at this event, the Charin Testable, it's not about OCPP testing necessarily, it's about ISO 15118 specifically. So, um, given that it's an AC charger, we do pre predominantly AC testing. We did it with uh, Hyundai, with a Lucid, Mercedes, BMW, and Audi as well. And um, the most interesting part here is plug and charge, because that's kind of like the king's discipline. Mm -hmm. If you can master that, then it's the most complex part of the standard itself, which involves, you know, digital certificates and a lot of crypto stuff uh, and a public key infrastructure ecosystem that is managed by Hubject that some of the audience may know. And um, it's basically an end-to-end -end integration testing between the charger talking to the vehicle, um, or the vehicle talking to the charger, the charger talking to our backend, and our backend talking to Hubject's PKI system. Right. <laughs> and, and this whole workflow needs to work seamlessly for plug and charge to work so that the user just needs to plug in the cable, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Authorization and payment is done in the background automatically. Right. So. With plug and charge, I know that this is a huge add to the experience, right? And just because you have that background with 15, ISO 15.11.8, uh, but plug and charge isn't widespread. We see it here and there with some automakers having that possible as well as charge point operators. But what is standing in the way of full adoption of this? It's a very good question. <laughs> I think mainly it's perceived complexity because it does involve um, as I said, cryptography, digital certificates, which is for charger manufacturers and, and car manufacturers, it's not their home turf necessarily. They're not really good at it. That's why we want to help them, you know, focus on the things that they are good at and just leave all the communication standards and crypto stuff to us. Mm -hmm. And when Hubject has been offering their PKI ecosystem that enables this whole plug and charge since many years, they do it in the US, they do it in Europe, they even do it in Asia. Um, so the ecosystem is there, it just needs the right implementation and, and you know, it needs to reach a certain maturity mm -hmm. um, so it works repetitively for the first time. Right. right? And, and that's somehow, implementation-wise, there are big gaps and differences still in the ecosystem. It's interesting that you say maturity, because in this kind of space, does that mean that it's just been around long enough, that we tested it enough, and then can figure out exactly where the pain points are, fix them, and then implement them? Well, the standard itself was published in 2014. That's almost a decade ago. We have only seen the first car um, enabling plug and charge in 2021 with the uh, Porsche Taycan. Mm -hmm. And then came other cars, like the Mach-E and Mercedes and so on and Audi. And um, when it comes to charge point operators, Electrify America and in the US, and maybe Electrify Canada, I guess, and uh, Ionity in Europe are the only ones that really do plug and charge. I'm sure there are more. I think Allego does as well and BP Pulse. Um, but it's only in recent years that they have been offering it. But still, for some reason, um, it took the car manufacturers a long time to, to commit themselves to the technology, to the community resources. But now if you talk to Hubject uh, and see um, on their website, the Hubject ecosystem, or plug and charge ecosystem, you see a lot of car manufacturers and charging station manufacturers listed. Whether or not they are already maturely implementing the standard, it's a different story, I don't know, but that's what we're here for to find out. Yeah, really cool. And um, one of the points here that you have under Joseph is easy integrated via well-defined and documented API. And I'm thinking, you know, from the perspective of someone who's going to 
implement Joseph into <laughs> my business, how, how would I go about that? I mean, it seems like if I already have something established, that's one thing where are you able to, are, basically, are you, are you going after more of the fresh companies, the new companies that are establishing from the bottom up, how they're going to run their network or the newer companies or those more established? Is there mm. a preference? It's a white mix. So right now, um, customers that we we can tell you about, about Joseph, is well, Zaptec, obviously. And there is also Elfen, which is a Dutch uh, manufacturer of charging stations. But the most interesting one currently is maybe ABB e-mobility. Mm -hmm. um, a very a, big player. In very big space. player in the DC and, and now also megawatt charging space. Right. And we are right now integrating Joseph into their MCS megawatt chargers as we speak. So s sometime early next year, uh, Q1, Q2, I would assume you see the first uh, ABB e-mobility chargers with Joseph in the field. And then these chargers can be hooked up to our switch platform for the best possible seamless charging experience, but it doesn't have to. They right. can also work with any other OCPP compliant, um, 201 compliant backend. So yeah, there are definitely different offerings that you have, but pa paired together, yeah. you know, you're convinced this is a, pr like a pretty ideal offering because not only do you have the front facing, but the back end where you're able yeah. to really diagnose what's going on, but also provide the experience. Exactly. Well. I mean, we are now a team of around 40 people. I would say 60, 70% are software engineers and product designers. Because for me, it's important that we get the software right, the product quality right, before we sell it on us. Yes. So we put like three years of R&D into this deep tech, vertically integrated product to make sure it is working seamlessly. So that's basically our, let's say, offer to charge point operators. We, we offer them a switch platform, but we also tell them, listen, these are the chargers that either ru are running on Joseph, so we know it's running perfectly because mm -hmm. it's tested with the switch team, or we also have the switch approved program now, which we offer to any charger manufacturer that have their own OCPP 2.0.1 implementation. We run a certain set of test cases, and if those test cases run successfully, then we um, take them up, um, or include them in the switch approved program which means we can offer a wider range of charger manufacturers to our CPO customers. Mm, okay, interesting. And you mentioned, you know, <coughs> the research that you did before bringing this to market because it's really important, the integrity of your product that you're offering, especially when this is such a experience-oriented industry. I mean, what isn't? But yeah. the EV adoption, I think, depends highly on what the public is experiencing and that word of mouth that we were talking about earlier that is really the strongest one of the exactly. forces on the planet. So can you tell me a little bit about the research and development on the back, that went before you were ready to take this to market? What was that like building it up? Well, basically, on the one hand side... Oh, that oh, might get a little bit loud. Should they maybe yeah. switch over to the other All place? Right, y'all. Okay. Follow us to a quieter space. Well, a, a brief interruption to get us to a quieter room because it does get a little bit loud in there when you turn on these chargers. But we were um, just you know, going into the question of the research and development behind your offering at Switch and, and, and Joseph. And basically, yeah, that if you're going to bring it to market, you want to have the integrity behind what you're offering. So you were telling me more and more details about that. Yeah. So will you resume? Happy to. Um, these communication standards, you need to be really well implemented and tested. Um, on the one hand side, just to give you like an idea of what I'm talking about here, ISO 1508, Dash 2 has like, I think, 360 pages, like more than like 800 re technical requirements. You want to make sure that all of this works pretty, pretty good. Then you have OCPP 2.0.1, which has, I think, also around 400 pages. Implementing each of those standards in itself is a challenge in itself. It's, it's doable. But making sure that they work seamlessly together is yet another challenge. And because you have experts in one and you have experts in the other, but you rarely have experts that are, you know, knowing both and you know how to, you know, intertwine them in such a way that it works seamlessly in the charging station. And that's where most chargers fail. You know, it's as simple as that. Um, as I said, we have a lot of breaking points. The, the car talking to the charger, that language is 5118, charger talking to the backend, like that language is OCPP, different flavors. Uh, backend talking to an MSP, which is a mobility service provider that gives you as an end customer access to the charger, is a roaming protocol. There you have OCPI, the Open Charge Point Interface. Um, then you have Open Intercharge, uh, Open Intercharge Protocol from Hubject. So you see there's like different languages that just need to you know be well implemented. Um, and 
at Switch, as we are focusing on a vertically integrated solution with a firmware on the charging station, think of it like an iOS, but for chargers, um, and then the back office solution, um, we need to make sure that this is working very um, smoothly. But on the other hand side, um, the reason why we focus on the latest communication standards is um, because it um, uplifts the user experience. We talked about the plug and charge. It's just you know, way more convenient to just plug in. But also um, to get to the point where you um, are able to reduce your maintenance costs as a charger uh, a charge point operator, you need to know what's going on on a charger. With OCPP 1.6, you have a very limited possibility. You have these so-called configuration keys, key value pairs. It, it's a bit limited. With OCPP 2.0.1, you have what they call a device model. It's not very, you know, telling the name. It's basically a lot of sensor data, like every sensor that you have in a charger, be it a temperature sensor or a flooding sensor or the fan speed or whatever it is, you can make visible in the platform now with that latest protocol. All of a sudden, you have a lot of data. Now, how do you make that um, visible to the chargement operator that is not always a technical CPO? We're not always talking about an Electrify America or an Ionity, but um, many businesses that by accident become a CPO, workplaces, hotels, um, any kind of fleets, they usually have no clue what ISO 5008 even is or OCPP, and they shouldn't know. So our challenge now as a switch is to present this information to the chargement operator in such a way that it's easily digestible and intuitive. And that is a whole new other challenge. Um, it's not just software development, it's product design, user research, extensive user research, validating your design hypotheses. Does it really make sense? Given a task, do you understand what you need to do to onboard a charger or to diagno diagnose an issue? And that's where we spend a lot of time um, so that's also part of our R&D. Very cool. So I feel, it makes me feel that you're kind of a bit of a Rosetta Stone, where you're kind of, yeah, commun understanding all this communication going on in the back end, translating it so that the end user is able to understand it, right? Definitely. Very, very important. Um, and so with all of that, of course, it's it's really complicated. You see where the value is, and I'd... I can see how you're communicating that you help actually save them costs on maintenance. So why do you think that your offering specifically is, you know, perhaps bringing more value to the other options that are already in place in the market or that are your competitors? Yeah. Well, one aspect is the vertical integration that I have been talking about. Um, because either you find companies that do embedded software or the back office software, but there is almost, I think there's no company that does what we do really. Also to the extent that we integrate not only between a vehicle and a, and a charger in the back office, but with other parties as well. We re recently launched um, our Switch App Store, which is basically the idea that we enable our charge point operators to integrate with all these services that are relevant for them to reduce their maintenance costs, to increase uptime, to improve 24-7 um, driver support, to um, send all the POI data of the charges to all kinds of map services like Waze, Google Maps, TomTom Tom here, and so on. Um, or V2G and V1G through our exclusive partnership with Nuve, that is a pioneer in V2G services. So now we enable all these integrations in what we call the App Store, and then our customers can just you know slide and say, yes, I want to activate it or not. Sometimes there is a specific user journey attached to that, so maybe there is some more like a form they need to fill out or some other information we need to gather. Depends on the integration, but I think that's where the industry needs to get to, and that no one is currently at least thinking about. Yeah, and I think that's also what makes us unique, aside from the fact that everyone we are demonstrating our platform to, they say it's the most user-friendly interface they have ever seen. So we really, really think very hard. How, to, how can we do it as intuitively as possible to present it to a charge point operator? And combining the idea of intuitiveness and integrations, of course, everything you see in our platform is um, accessible through our open API with third parties. But what we, what we also learned is there are some businesses that um, have maybe an existing back office. They invested a lot of money in it. They don't want to ditch it. But they have some need, let's say, managing OCPP 2.0.1 chargers that they don't, they can't do. So they can use our API to manage those chargers. We send them the data that they need, 
and it's just one of the examples. Another one related to maintenance costs is where we actually want to get to is if a charger um, reports an issue, the charge pin operator often has no clue what to do, right? So the, the use case would be, okay, so there's a notification. Now I need to call my maintenance company or send them an email. It gets into their you know, ticketing system and so on. Ideally, we would have an integration with the maintenance company already that is automatically when the charger is triggering a notification, it triggers the ticket at the maintenance company. So that's, I think, another step that we need to get to so that its charge pin operator's job is, you know, just checking, <laughs> is my charge network working reliably or not? Um, and we want to help our charge pin operators increase their revenue, give them advice how to improve their uptime or or maybe which locations are more profitable than others based on a lot of data that we that we gather over time. So I think it's more about helping them to increase revenue, add more revenue streams, and alleviate the need to actually go into the nitty-gritty of maintenance. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you're considering site hosts that are, you know, maybe like with a charge point kind of business model, like I'm, ta I'm taking this on this responsibility and I want to provide charging, but I don't know anything about it. And either you have to take a course or whatever or have the system around you. But um, yeah, to be able to build that in so that one, there can be more charging, but that even if you're not, you know, a huge pro, but if you're providing the service that you have it built in the back end. So the holistic approach, I think, is really valuable in this space that is very fragmented, as you know, <laughs> along the way. And one thing that I think also brings value that we were talking about earlier as well is you're, of course, you're considering Nevi. And so I'd love to, you know, help our audience explain, because Nevi, I think in general, we know a lot about Nevi, like we can get discounts on our EVs and it's going to put in uh, more infrastructure along the way, but there's even, there's so many nitty gritty details about Nevi. Um, and how does this play into the communication that's going on? And then how does your offering make sure to consider that as well to bring value to the U.S., of course? Yeah, yeah there's a lot of requirements around Nevi, but the ones that we are tackling is obviously the ones around the communication standards themselves. So um, specifically ISO 1511 plug and charge is demanded. Um, um, for the best possible user experience than OCPP 2.0.1 um, because of the advanced diagnostics data, again, helping to reduce maintenance and increase uptime. And when it comes to the integration between the charge point operators and the mobility service providers or any kind of integration, it's the OCPI protocol, the Open Charge Point Interface, I think in its latest version 2.2.1. Um, and also there's a certain uptime requirement, I think 97%. Yeah. And they... They even provide a certain formula of how you calculate uptime, which should be a combination of uptime of a charger itself plus the uptime of the software in the back end. Um, and then we are also bringing this uptime um, um, number basically in our platform as well. We show a status of how you know well is our software up, up. <laughs> what's the uptime of the software, and 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 uh, the cellular connection is maybe a bit flaky depending on on where the charger is located. Um, yeah, this is my knowledge of Navi. There's I'm sure a lot more that, that you may know more about as well. No, yeah, that sounds that sounds about that sounds about right. And I think that's important to consider. And um, there's I think always more we can learn about. And it's interesting to know how multifaceted Nevi is because when we think about the government getting involved and putting restrictions on the infrastructure that we're putting in, we wanna hope that it's helpful, right? More than anything. Like very, very helpful. And um, so what you are mentioning about how it's going to affect uptime and reliability is obviously a huge piece of conversation in this space. So um, th I think that's something to really, really consider, of course, in, in terms of your value proposition um, to your partners. And I, I where what's your um, launch like? If I was a customer and I wanted to implement this on my, well, it depends if I'm a manufacturer, right? Or if I'm operating, right, which can be different, um, usually are, but how would I be, what is, how quickly can I integrate, whether it's the diagnostics or the, the more of the front end, the um, Joseph into my system? So with Joseph, we have basically two offerings. One is the Joseph Pro full package, um, the whole 5.11.8 OCPP, um, and 10 days of the integration effort um, from Switch. And because we believe if a charger manufacturer is putting their resources into it, um, it, it's not requiring more than two weeks, maybe three weeks, to get Joseph integrated. Um, how does it work? We have a well-defined API, 
documentation um, that shows all the, you know, the communication that goes on between our own software stacks, but also how to integrate your own hardware as a charger manufacturer. Right now it's working through an, what we call an MQTT message broker. Um, this is an IoT protocol that has been around since the 70s, MQTT. Um, next step would be to, to implement the software to interface directly with the hardware, like drivers for different power modules or smart meters or something. So this would be the next step. Makes it even easier for the charger manufacturer, but one step at a time. So that's Joseph. Um, usage platform, well, um, we try to make it as easy as possible for existing networks to switch over. Um, for ex with, there's a slight difference in effort when it comes to OCPP 1.6 and 201, because with 1.6 chargers, you have to manually reconfigure the charger to point it to a different backend. Um, with OCPP 201, you can do that in the backend already. So you, you can do it from your laptop and you say, okay, point this to a different backend. And that's another reason why you sh we should all switch to 201. It makes life a lot easier. Um, we, um, you know, we enable batch uploads of like a CSV file. So if you have, I don't know, like 20, 30, 100 or whatever, thousands of stations, you have all these um, kind of configuration data in terms of, you know, the station ID, the station password, the URL to which it should be um, pointed to, then you can um, upload that to our um, switch platform. And then, yeah, every charger needs to be still manually configured, as I said, but it just makes the effort on our platform as little as possible or as, as seamless as possible. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Inter integrating a new you know system in general, as I've heard, I haven't had to do that at a company, but it can be a bit of a headache, but it sounds like in some ways it, it doesn't have to take that long and that obviously you'd be supportive along the way. Maybe one more thing. Yes. Um, so we, we have a customer success team and our customer success manager, Isabel, she um, recently told me, um, we provide a one hour onboarding session with all our new CPO customers. Um, but usually it's about a 10 to 15 minute onboarding, um, if at all needed. And then the rest of the time they just chat about you know what are your plans, how we can support you in the best possible way. And they, they get the onboarding, um, we guide them through how to add a location, how to add a station, and then they ask, that's it? Because they are just used to have like hours or even days of onboarding because systems, back office systems have grown over time and they kind of forgot the user yeah. in between, how to make it very intuitive. Yeah, you seem to be very user focused on, I mean, there's so many different users along the way of the charging journey. So to focus on all of them is a big undertaking, but I do like that you really consider, um, I mean, it's it's a double entendre communication, of course, that's going on with the technology, but communication with the end user, I think is really, really important. And uh, the question that comes to mind as we speak to vertical integration, which not only you're doing within Switch, I mean, you kind of referenced that a bit, but of course, in this space, we see like Tesla's super successful because they have a ton of vertical integration. Ford has talked about how they're moving towards more and more vertical integration. But when implementing um, like Switch and Joseph, it's, it's you know, bringing it's kind of an outside factor into uh, something. So why, what would be your argument against trying to do what you're doing internally and instead like bringing in your offering? Do you understand? Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to Tesla's vertical integration, our vertical integration, it's slightly different in the sense that we are based on open communication protocols. So um, we just can guarantee the best possible experience, but we don't require, let's say, a charger running on Joseph to be connected to the switch platform. Any charger talking 201 or 1.6 or CPP, we can work with, as long as they respect the specification and don't deviate too much. Um, with Tesla, um, I mean, we all need to be thankful for how they push the industry forward, right? And they're doing an amazing job. But what we're trying to achieve is giving the Tesla experience to all charger manufacturers and car manufacturers as an extension um, with the plug and charge functionality that is a feature of ISO 15.11.8. Um, and that's where we need to get to because otherwise, um, we all know, you know, Carl's videos and online reports of people just being sick of unreliable chargers. And this delays the electrification of transport, decarbonization. And yeah, it's overall not really good for our climate, obviously. Um, so we, we are doing vertical integration in a, in a sense that it's open. Um, Tesla is opening itself up more and more as well. Interestingly, we have seen that they are selling their chargers now to, to others like BP Pulse and 
There is also a UK company, I forgot its name, EG or something. Um, <clears throat> I'm personally interested to see where they are headed, because I've heard that they are <clears throat> working towards adopting OCPP, but I'm not sure when this will finally happen. So they are working with the Open Charge Alliance. Um, so I'm not sure if, like, let's say, this BP deal, if this will work based on OCPP already, or if there is a specific Tesla API they need to integrate with. We'll see. We'll have to see. And um, I mean, as, as Kyle mentioned earlier before off, off camera, but that we'd like love to have you on the podcast more. This is a great introduction, I think, to our audience of you and um, kind of like the work that you're doing and also how complicated it gets on the back end. Because I think when you pull up to an EV station, you plug in. Our experience of gassing up our cars, we didn't, we don't think about it. You just put one into the other and then it, everything works, right? But now it's a lot of the back end that's not happening. And when a charging session fails, you don't know why. I mean, whether error messages bringing those up again, sometimes it just says like charging stopped, error message, whatever. And even sometimes the charge point operators aren't sure what's happening, which again is when some of your value proposition comes in. But um, my question for you now is, of course, you have a lot of experience in standards. And so what do you think it'll take to get to a more standardized place is it is it coming in like you know it's it's going to come it's essential no matter what or do you think that there's efforts that still need to take place to get everyone basically aligned and on the same page so that we're all essentially using the same standards across the way the same communication what is essential to get there and i mean in general what do you think about that are we on our way there we are on our way there, I think, although it's a very long way. Um, the, we are here right now at a, at a testival. A testival is like a, you know, a testing event between chargers and cars and um, to test their software. The first testing event happened in 2014. So it's now nine years later, and we are still doing interop tests. Yeah. So it is, it is mind-boggling. But I think the main issue is because we don't have a certification available yet for, let's say, plug and charge. We do have it for OCPP. Um, 201, that's great. So Switch got certified for OCPP 201 back in June when they opened the certification program. But there's no certification for plug and charge. Hubject is kind of stepping in there and doing an audit, um, which is kind of like a certification, but not officially supported by Charin. Charin is the body um, that is kind of fostering CCS and ISO 151108. Um, so Switch has been audited by Hubject on the back office system, but now also on the Joseph side of things. We just want to give our customers the confidence that we're doing everything to make sure it's working reliably. But the official testing body would be DECRA, for example. I think there are right now two test labs that are officially recognized by Charin. One is DECRA. The other one is um, Kevit, I think, or I forgot the name, in Korea somewhere. And I think right now there are two or three more test labs that are trying to get accredited by Charin. The way it works is there's a set of test interoperability test cases that need to be um, validated for all these test systems by Charin. So to make sure that once you run your um, car or your EV against one testing system, the result needs to be exactly the same for all test systems. Mm -hmm. This takes, unfortunately, a bit longer. I heard this, hopefully we'll get there sometime next year. It was supposed to be by the end of this year, but it's again being shifted because new test labs are coming in. They also want to be a test lab. It all delays the process. But once we have an official test lab able to certify charges and, and cars and provide a seal of approval, then we can have the confidence that this really works. At least we get to a better place. And right now, companies can say, yeah, we do plug and charge, but you don't know if it's, if it's true or not, how mature it is. Is there, an, on this point, is there another industry that you look at and you're like, oh, we need to embody what this industry that's probably a lot older than the EV charging industry has done and how they've advanced into the way that we're doing things here? I know you just made a lot of points about how we're going to uh, get to a more stable spot, a more grounded spot. But is yeah, do you take any uh, basically inspiration from history in terms of that evolution? Well, yeah, you can draw a parallel to the uh, telecommunications industry. Um, because I'm not sure when it started, like in the 90s or so. Um, but there's a, a lot of things that are very similar. In the, in the beginning, you had you know GSM, then you had um, Edge and, and 3G and so on. You had manufacturers um, that provided their own chipset and, and, and their own handhelds and so on. Um, we are basically in an early stage of where the tele 
communications industry has been, I don't know, two decades before. We need to get to a stage, if I may draw this metaphor, to where we are now with like 5G or 4G. It just works. You have your phone, you have your contract, you have usually flat rates. You expect it to work wherever you are, whether you are in where I'm from in London or in the US, here in Cleveland or in South America or in China, wherever. It's supposed to work. Um, I hope that we will be there in, I don't know, the next two years. <laughs> we will see. And think of it, how the experience is today. Um, the statistics were right, but the, the latest Wall Street Journal video, the woman said in LA, where she did all these tests, 60% of the charges worked, 40% didn't work. Or was it the other way around? Only 40% worked? I'm not sure. But it was a high number, it, it didn't work. Mainly it's authorization and payment issues. Yeah. Then sometimes it's a broken display or the connectivity is just, you know, not there. If you were going to a gas station and only in 60% of the cases you were able to refuel your car, this would be outrageous. No one would accept this. No. Or maybe a different example, you would go to a cinema trying to buy a ticket and only in 60% of the cases you're able to see the movie. This is like, of course no one accepts this. Why are we accepting this in the EV industry? Why are we going through all this pain? Why are we accepting this mediocre quality? I don't know. Hmm. We have to fix it, but yeah. Yeah, especially especially for calling it you know critical infrastructure, right? Um, it needs to be critically considered, and I think people are very critical of it, which is you know warranted. Um, but it's really cool to meet people like you in the space who are working to make it better. And so maybe to wrap things up, and again, I hope we have you on the podcast a lot more, especially to like break down the behind the scenes of what's happening on the charging sessions and let Kyle and you dive into the nitty gritty techie details. Um, but what, you know, I, I, I know a little bit about your path to get here, but what, what's your motivation for working in this space and continuing on this work every day? Um, well, I'm in this industry now since I think 14 years. Um, it started with my, uh, I'm a computer scientist um, by, by, nature, by background, and I did my PhD in computer science, started it in 2009, and my topic was how to integrate electric vehicles as a mobile energy storage device into the grid. Ahead of the game. <clears throat> and in 2014, I defended my thesis, and um, basically, V2G was my topic, and how can we leverage ISO 15118, which just became a standard, or was about, uh, was kind of like drafted, in 2010 throughout 2014 and I basically started from the very beginning because um, you know at university you know I thought why trying to reinvent the wheel if there is a standardization body solving this problem communication between car and charger so I implemented the first version of that standard I instantly saw the potential that this is you know where the industry needs to move to and I had the idea when I finished my PhD in 2014 that I help understand the industry, what 1508 is about. It was way too early. So I joined a startup um, back then in Germany, where I'm from originally, and I learned a lot about the industry. What is a charge point operator? What is a mobility service provider? What is OCPP? It was a good learning curve for me. And then in 2016, this, this startup unfortunately didn't make it. Um, I was employee number one, so not the co-founder, luckily. Um, but I used the opportunity to... Um, to um, become self a self-employed consultant. And that's when I started to do all my ISO 15118 trainings for companies, um, corporate training. I did online courses even. I wrote a book called the ISO 15118 Manual, which is now the standard um, literature for any charger and car uh, um, company doing ISO 15118. And I've been doing these trainings until, I'm still doing them, but in 2020, early 2020, I was, <laughs> sitting in Bali, because <clears throat> I was, back then, a digital nomad. I could work from anywhere on my laptop, uh, sipping my coconut, and I thought, this can't be it, you know? I'm doing these trainings since four years then. I don't see any product on the market. I need to move the needle further. What can I do? And yeah, I decided I have to build a software company to really help the charging manufacturers on the one hand side to, you know, do a leapfrog development and get to the market. Fast forward almost four years later, um, here we are. Switch with two products and 40 people, mainly based in uh, the UK, London. We now also have an office in Munich and uh, soon also more people in the US. Wow. Very cool story. I love that. Taking it in, into your own hands. And there's a lot of ways you could have gone about it. But um, yeah, your background really led you there. 
Yeah, so thank you. It was really great um, speaking with you today. Of course, this event is really fun. A lot of testing going on. Wish we could show you more, but it's a little, you know, can't show you everything. Um, but Kyle and, F Kyle and I will follow up about it. Uh, we, again, like I said, would love to have you on the podcast more. Of course, audience, let us know if you have any questions of what we could dive into in the future because you're just so a wealth of knowledge and your experience is very, very interesting. So thank you for your time to come on and explain not only Switch, but also Joseph and then just... Yeah, uh, basically your opinions on this really dynamic industry that we've continued to wait for a little bit, but also that has advanced a good bit. Well, thanks a lot for having me. And um, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to the next episodes. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in and we will see you next time on the Out of Spec Podcast. Bye -bye.